The year was 1934. A man in a gray coat walked into a large hall filled with Nazi officials and engineers. He carried a folder with some papers and sketches. He looked nervous, but confident. He knew he had a chance to make history. He was Ferdinand Porsche, one of the most brilliant and talented car designers in the world. And he was about to present his proposal for a new car project, the Volkswagen, or the people's car. This project was the brainchild of Adolf Hitler, the new chancellor of Germany. He wanted to create a car that every German citizen could afford and enjoy. A car that could fit a family of five and be fuel efficient and cheap, very cheap. It had to cost only 990 Reichsmarks, which many engineers thought was impossible. But Porsche thought he could do it. He had been dreaming of making his own car since he was a young boy. He had been working on cars for almost 40 years and he had created some of the most amazing and innovative vehicles ever seen. He had a passion for electricity and a vision for the future. But how did he get here? How did he become one of the most famous and influential car makers in history? And what secrets and scandals lay behind his success? To answer these questions, we had to go back to where it all began. We had to go back to 1875 in a small village in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, now part of the Czech Republic. There in a humble house, a baby boy was born. His name was Ferdinand Porsche. He grew up in a poor family with a father who ran a blacksmith shop. He didn't like the family business. He didn't like school either. He liked to play with machines and electricity. He was fascinated by the light bulb, which was just starting to replace candles and gas lamps. He experimented with electric circuits in his attic using wires and batteries he found or made himself. His father didn't approve of his hobby. He told him to stop wasting his time with such nonsense. He wanted him to work in the shop and learn the trade. He wanted him to be practical and realistic. But Ferdinand had other plans. He wanted to be creative and adventurous. He wanted to make something new and exciting. He got his chance when he was 14 years old. His older brother died in an accident, leaving him as the eldest son. He had to take care of the family and work full time at his father's shop. But he also got an opportunity. His father enrolled him in the Imperial Technical School of Reichenberg, where he could learn more about engineering and electricity. There, he excelled at everything he did. He learned fast and worked hard. He impressed his teachers and classmates with his skills and ideas. Within a few months, he built his own electric generator and installed electric lights all over his house. His father finally saw his son's talent and let him follow his own path. They didn't know it yet, but this path would lead him to pioneer a brand new industry automobiles. In 1893, at the age of 18, Ferdinand left his home and got his first job at Bella Egger & Co., a manufacturer of electric machinery in Vienna. He soon proved himself as a brilliant and skilled engineer and rose through the ranks becoming the manager. During his time at Bella Egger, Ferdinand Porsche built the company's first electric wheel hub motor. This was an electric motor that could be attached to any vehicle's wheel and make it move directly. It was mainly used for bicycles at first, but Ferdinand had other ideas for this motor. Around this time, the first cars were creating a huge buzz among people and engineers who wanted to join the new industry. And Ferdinand was one of them. He quit his job and joined Jacob Lohner & Co, who had switched from making carriages to making self-powered vehicles. There, he used his electric motors to build his first car, the Porsche P1. The Porsche P1 was a fully electric car made from a wooden carriage. It had a range of about 49 miles, but it was very slow. It could only go up to 21 miles per hour because of the heavy lead acid batteries it carried. The car was meant for racing, but cars back then were not really seen as a way to get around. They were mostly built for competition and tested in races all over Europe and America. Porsche kept improving his car until 1900, when he added an internal combustion engine to power the electric motors. He created the world's first gas electric hybrid car, the Lohner Porsche Electromobile. This new car was a big hit in various motorsport events. It broke several Austrian speed records, reaching a top speed of 36 miles per hour. Porsche and Lohner parted ways a few years later, and then Porsche was hired by Austro Daimler as their chief designer. Daimler was the leader in modern combustion engines, and there, Porsche designed his first purely petrol car, the Austro Daimler Mayra in 1908. His time at the company was a big boost for his career. He got his first big break in the racing world when he developed his next car the Austro Daimler Model 27-80. This 85 horsepower car would go up to 85 miles per hour. It was built for the popular Prince Henry trial race in 1910, where it won first, second, and third place. 
this win made him famous and earned him the title of professor at the company. But then the First World War broke out in 1914, and Porsche made groundbreaking designs for military aircrafts and airship engines, as well as artillery tractors like the M17 Goliath. He became one of the best engineers of his time, but he also became one of the most controversial ones. After the war ended in 1918, Ferdinand and Porsche went back to building race cars, and by 1922, he had another car ready, the Austro Daimler Sasha. Porsche thought that making a smaller car than his rivals would give him an edge in racing. He had more powerful engines, so he tested his new car in many races, and he was right. The Sasha won an amazing 43 out of 53 races, including the Targa Florio. He then moved to Stuttgart, the capital of Germany, and became the chief engineer for Daimler Benz. There, he designed and built the luxurious Mercedes-Benz S-Series, which was one of the first high-performance sports cars that was good for both racing and driving. And in 1928, he introduced one of the fastest and greatest sports cars of his time, the Mercedes-Benz SSK. The SSK, or Super Sport Curs, had a huge 7.1-liter six-cylinder engine with 200 to 300 horsepower. It could go up to 235 kilometers per hour. This car was a champion in many races, like the Mail Niglia in 1931. It was the best, fastest, and most valuable sports car in the world. Porsche also built a sleeker version of the SSK, the Trossi Roadster. It was a phenomenon for its extravagant look and made him one of the greatest car designers ever. But soon after, Ferdinand Porsche left the company and founded his own car company, Porsche GmbH. He hired many of his former colleagues to work with him, and one of them was very special, his son, Ferry Porsche. Ferry was like his father. He loved designing and engineering cars. He learned fast and worked hard to impress his talented father. At first, the Porsche company didn't make cars under their own name. They just offered consulting and motor development projects for other car makers. But there was a big problem. There were no clients. The country was still recovering from the economic crisis of the First World War, and people didn't want to buy cars. They were too expensive and impractical. But then one day, Ferdinand received a letter that changed everything for his company, and it came from a very surprising source, Adolf Hitler. In 1933, Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany, and he had a special interest in cars. He wanted to create a car that every German citizen could afford and enjoy, a car that could fit a family of five and be fuel efficient and cheap, very cheap. It had to cost only 990 Reichsmarks, which many engineers thought was impossible. He called it the Volkswagen, or the people's car. Porsche submitted his design and won the contract from Hitler. This started an unusual but great relationship between them. Hitler needed a creative mind to design his dream car, and Porsche needed political support for his company, so he didn't have to worry about money or finances. So in 1934, Porsche and his team started to work on building one of the most successful cars ever, the Volkswagen Beetle. The Volkswagen Type 1, later known as the Beetleford's shape, was a two-door car with an air-cooled engine in the back. This made the engine easy to maintain and the steering easy to handle, thanks to the weight balance. It was also very fuel efficient, with a mileage of 31.4 miles per gallon, which was still impressive then. Porsche was eager to see his creation in action. He had been dreaming of making his own car since he was a young boy. He had been working on cars for almost 40 years, and he had created some of the most amazing and innovative vehicles ever seen. But as the Volkswagen factory was getting ready to mass produce the car, another major event happened that changed Porsche's bright career for the worse. Hitler invaded Poland in September 1939, which started the Second World War. Suddenly, the Beetle production was stopped, and the Volkswagen factory switched to making war supplies. Being one of the best engineers in Germany and a close friend of Hitler, Porsche got involved in military projects for the Nazi army. He made off-road military vehicles and weapons, like the Schimwagen, the military version of the Beetle, the Elephant Tank Destroyer, and the V1 Flying Bomb Missile. But even though Porsche was one of Hitler's favorite engineers, he failed to impress him when it came to designing tanks. He designed a hybrid tank that ran on petrol electric transmissions, but it was too complex and over-engineered, and it broke down during the trial he lost the contract to another company. But Porsche had a bigger problem. He had already built 100 chassis for his tank before he submitted his prototype. To save his designs, the Germans turned 90 of them into tank destroyers and renamed them as elephants. They were very powerful in the war, but they had many engine problems and mobility issues. Most of them broke down and were lost on the battlefield. It was also reported that the Porsche company used slave laborers in their Stuttgart factory, though they denied it at first. 
but later they admitted their crimes after many people came forward in the late 20th century. But even though he worked with the Nazis, Ferdinand Porsche didn't really agree with their ideology. He rarely raised his arm in Hitler's salute, and his baggy gray coat always stood out among the uniformed Nazis. He didn't know it yet, but his involvement in the war would come at a high cost. After the war ended, Ferdinand Porsche was arrested by the French government and sent to prison for war crimes. And his son Ferry had to take over the Porsche brand and lead it in a new and better direction. Ferry had inherited his father's passion and talent for machines. He had already built several vehicles like the Schimmwagen, which meant a swimming car in German. This car could drive on land and water, and it was very useful for German soldiers during the war. The only reason he was released by the French government was so that he could find the money to bail his father out of prison. Fieri got the money by signing a contract with an Italian car maker called Cisitalia, where he built a very advanced car for its time. But sadly, the terrible conditions in prison had ruined Ferdinand's health. He died soon after and he couldn't work anymore. So it was up to Ferry Porsche to take charge of their company and make his father's ideas come true. He made a deal with Volkswagen that let him use their parts and their distribution network. He also showed them that his father had developed the Beetle before the war, which made Volkswagen agree to pay Porsche a license fee for every Beetle they made. And so, in 1948, Ferry introduced the first car that had the family name, the Porsche 356. The 356 was a small two-door roadster with a Volkswagen air-cooled engine. It could go up to 87 miles per hour, but Ferry kept improving it and making it faster and smoother. He took it to a race in Innsbruck, Austria, where it won first place. He was proud of his creation. He thought it was his best work ever. He thought it would change the world. And he was right. The 356 became one of the most successful sports cars ever made. It sold over 76,000 units worldwide, and it was loved by millions of people for its performance and style. But Porsche's customers wanted something new and different. They needed a new car that was still recognizable as a Porsche. That's when one of Ferry's sons stepped in and made a new car that would take Porsche to a new level the 911. The Icon Ferdinand Alexander Porsche, or F.A., was like his father. He loved cars from an early age and worked in the car industry. But he was more into design than engineering. He called himself a craftsman who could shape things. He designed one of the most iconic sports cars ever, the 911. The Porsche 911 was much better than the 356. It had a six-cylinder boxer engine instead of a four-cylinder one, and it was still air-cooled and in the back. This made the engine easy to maintain and the steering and acceleration better because of the weight balance. The car was so smooth to drive that no other car could match it, and it was not only fast, but also reliable. The new model came out in September 1964 and soon became their best-selling car, and Porsche kept making it better and faster with more horsepower models like the 911 Carrera S and 911 Turbo. But Porsche didn't stop there. In the 1970s, they took the 911 to the racing world and they dominated it. The car won at almost every motorsport event, like the Monte Carlo Rally, the Targa Floria, the Paris Dakar, and many other rally and GT championships. It became one of the most successful race cars ever. Ferry Porsche retired from his role at the company around that time, and none of his sons wanted to take over, so the family council decided to split the company's shares and let someone else run it. This was the end of the family's involvement in the company. But Porsche kept making better and sportier cars, and they became one of the top sports car brands in the world. But nothing lasts forever. A dark time was coming for Porsche, and they had to make a big change to survive. In 1986, the CEO of Porsche, Peter Schutz, went into a room where Porsche executives and shareholders were gathered. He wore a suit. He informed them that Porsche had lost 240 million Dutch marks, and their sales had fallen to 23,000 units, which was only half of what they sold five years ago. He made it clear that Porsche was facing serious problems. He urged them to take quick action or risk going bankrupt. He suggested a daring solution. They should create an SUV. An SUV or sport utility vehicle was a large car that could carry more people and cargo than a regular car. It was also good for off-road driving and rough terrain. It was becoming very popular in America, where people liked big cars and had a lot of space. But this idea got a lot of backlash from Porsche fans and purists. They thought that making an SUV was a betrayal of the Porsche brand and identity. They thought that Porsche had always made high quality luxury sports cars that were good for both driving and racing. But Schutz thought that making an SUV was the only way to save Porsche from bankruptcy. He thought that making an SUV would attract new customers and markets and generate more revenue and profits for the company. And he was right. The Porsche Cayenne came out in 2002, and it was a huge hit. 
and not only became their best-selling car, but also a fan favorite. The Cayenne saved Porsche from bankruptcy, and today, the Cayenne and the newer Macan make up over 70% of Porsche's sales in America. But Porsche never forgot their sports car roots, and their new models like the Porsche Panamera and the fully electric Taycan are among their best-selling sports cars today. Porsche is now owned by the Volkswagen Group, and they are still one of the best luxury car brands in the world. This is the story of Porsche, and how they became one of the most famous luxury car brands in the world. It's a story of success, tragedy, innovation, and destruction. But it's also a story of passion, talent, vision, and resilience. I hope you enjoyed this remarkable tale of automotive excellence, and we look forward to bringing you more captivating stories in the future. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more compelling content. Until next time, stay driven.